Hey guys, welcome back. My name is Megan Tennant. This is my co-host, Khajiit. His name is copyrighted. We didn't think that one through. And he just whipped me with his tail. My goodness. This topic was a suggestion from one of my lovely kittens over on Patreon. If you want to become a kitten, just head over to Patreon, search Cloud Kitten Chronicles. There's a suggestion box that goes live once a month, and Courtney Levitt wanted to hear more about coincidences and luck in writing. So this video is dedicated to Courtney Levitt. She is a writer, she is wonderful, she's doing a cool book that involves metal dragons. Cats are running around around me. I'm in a battle zone. It is terrifying. Mrow to you too. Uh, where was I? Metal Dragons, yes. If you want to be one of the first ones to hear when that book is coming out, and if you just want a really cool writer friend, you can find Courtney Lovett. I will link her social medias in the description down below. So on to the topic. Think of a story like magic, where the luck and coincidences are tricks involving strings and wires. If each tug of the string is flawless, if there are smoke and mirrors, and there's a proper audience diversion, then the audience will never even realize that there are strings at all. But if you make one tiny little mistake and let one string show, then half of the audience is gonna start looking for strings, which means they're gonna start to see strings even where there aren't any. That's what luck and coincidences are. They can and are used, and they can benefit a story, but you have to use them very carefully. So in this video, I am going to cover Deus Ex Machina, why the audience hates coincidences, not all coincidences are bad, how to fix coincidences, and coincidences that need to die. First things first, we need to address the giant god machine in the room. And by that, I mean Deus Ex Machina. Deus Ex Machina is a Latin term, and it is derived from ancient Greek theater, where they used to use machines like cranes to lower actors down onto the stage where they could play god. So this literally translates to god from the machine. Can you see his tail in the corner of the screen? Is it too high up? Do you see that? There's a cat there. So this term is now used to refer to a plot device generally occurring around or near the climax by which an unsolvable problem is abruptly resolved by either luck or coincidence. The eagles are coming! Though this can be used effectively as a comedic device, What are the odds that trapdoor laid me out here? It's often criticized in standard literature and with good reason. It's generally viewed as inartistic, it often undermines the character's growth, and generally tends to break the internal logic of the story and with it, your audience's suspension of disbelief. Deus Ex Machina use can leave the audience feeling like the author included it just to write themselves out of a corner they backed themselves into because of lack of skill or foresight. Generally speaking, unless you're writing comedy or parody, then Deus Ex Machina should get the chopping block. Next up, why the audience hates coincidences. Okay, so we've established that the audience generally hates Deus Ex Machina. That's something that probably a lot of you already knew. But what about more standard coincidences? After all, coincidences are a realistic part of life. And we often find ourselves marveling at how small the world is that this could happen. And we find ourselves asking, what are the odds? But here's the thing, fiction isn't real life. When a crazy coincidence happens in day-to-day -day life, people often say, you can't make this up. To which I respond, watch me, that's my job. But beyond that, you'll also hear people say things like, no one will believe me when I tell them this happened. So when the audience sees a coincidence in a story, they don't see something extraordinary. Instead, they just see the author. And as odd as it sounds, one of our greatest jobs as a writer is to make sure that the audience never thinks of a story as even having a writer. Because as soon as they start thinking about the story's writing, they've seen the strings controlling the story, and now that they've seen them, it's a struggle to get back to that point where everything felt like magic. Okay then, so we cut out all of the coincidences. Coincidences are inherently bad. But here's the thing, they aren't. Can you not eat that? Thanks. 
So there are a couple scenarios in which the audience tends to let coincidences slide, and sometimes they even enjoy them. So first and foremost, the one place where you can reliably use a major coincidence without risking your reader's precious suspension of disbelief is right at the start of your story. Here we go again. Okay. You'll find that a huge portion of inciting incidences fall into this category. For example, think of the Hunger Games. <laughs> that was my face. Can you see the fur floating through the air? It's everywhere. Look, you see that? You probably can't see that. Oh, that was one of my own hairs. I can't even blame you for that. It's your first year, Prim. Your name's only been in there once. They're not gonna pick you. Primrose Everdeen. What are the actual odds that hers would be the name drawn? But we don't bat our eyes once at this coincidence. Why? Because it's the inciting incident. And also because of this weird phenomena that I have observed, which I have chosen to name the Climax to Coincidence Gradient. Gradient. It sounds much fancier on paper, I will have you know. It needs another C. Climax to Coincidence Quotient? That doesn't make any sense. Curve! Bam! I named it. I coined this. It might already exist. I don't know. I didn't Google it. I should probably Google it. And so yes, the audience's likelihood to swallow a coincidence manifests in the form of a curve, where on the x-axis we have the level of coincidence that they will swallow without choking, and on the y-axis we have a point in the story at which we find ourselves. I think this is because in the opening scene, we have yet to learn the internal logic of a story. We're primed to yank our misbelief out of the way of pretty much any obstacle. And secondly, the character hasn't grown yet, so using a coincidence as a plot device doesn't undermine their sacrifices. Now that's not to say you can't do sex machina it up in the first chapter, but it's gonna be a lot harder. Especially since you are generally using the coincidence as a way to create problems for your character. Which brings us to the second form of coincidence that your audience will swallow without choking, and that is coincidences that make life harder on your protagonist. Because they know that you're not using this to write yourself out of a corner you backed into, you're using this to essentially make more corners for you to potentially walk into. You do have to ration them though, because if you're throwing coincidence-based conflict at your protagonist left and right, your reader is going to get frustrated. Some of your conflict needs to come from the villain, some of the conflict needs to come from your protagonist's own mistakes and flaws, and the smallest source of conflict by far present in your novel should be in the form of coincidences. So the first coincidence type that people are generally much more accepting of is characters having shared pasts and common friends. So these are things that add depth and intrigue and maybe open up different plot lines, but don't get their hands directly on our plot strings. Timing is another big one that's generally accepted. Characters happening to end up in the same place at the same time when it's realistic for them to be in those places. A character happening to deactivate a bomb a mere second before it goes off. Those kinds of things where the only real change is added tension pretty much always slip under the radar. Now it's also worth noting that acceptable forms of coincidences vary a ton between different genres and age groups. For example, in middle grade, it's much more acceptable for a character to be dragged around by the plot, and therefore more acceptable for coincidences to be a thing. Okay, so some of you out there right now are freaking out because maybe your story is full to the brim with coincidences. Don't panic yet, there are still some ways out. And here's a couple ways that you can fix them. First up, does it have to be luck and coincidences or are you just too scared to, you know, step back a couple chapters and rewrite? Let's look at an example. So you know that you want the bounty hunter to stumble upon your fleeing convicts while they hide out in a pub. But here's the thing, there are seven well-known pubs in the area of Atria they crash landed on. So what are the odds that the bounty hunter walks into the same pub that they do? You could have this happen by a pure coincidence. Or, or, you could write an explanation. Yes, there are seven well-known pubs but maybe one of them prohibits humans. Maybe another one is a common meeting place for bounty hunters. Maybe another one is in a strictly patrolled secure district. Maybe the other one is notorious for having terrible ale or space ale or space, 
I'm already, I'm already feeling the pull to world build this world that I created for a five second example. Someone stop me. So that leaves two options. Now let's say that our fleeing convicts choose one of the two because one of their exes works at the other one. Now the bounty hunter doesn't know this. So let's say he's just bouncing back and forth between the two pubs that he knows are options, just hoping to run into them. So yes, there's a little aspect of coincidence here, but it's believable and it's something you can quickly convey in a conversation between the convicts as they decide which pub to hide out in. Yes, in my mind, somehow the convicts ended up being the main characters here. I don't know how that happened. Anyways, foreshadowing is your best friend in this scenario because you'll prove to the audience that you had this planned all along. Little do they know you actually went back and edited in the foreshadowing because we do that, but they don't have to know that we do that. Next potential fix, can your coincidence later be revealed as engineered? When not too outlandish, you can carefully use a coincidence as a holding point while you wait to get all of your characters in the right room to reveal the coincidence as engineered. Holy mother forking shirt balls. What? In this scenario, you do the clever thing of establishing the strings, but then later revealing that the strings were controlled by other characters all along and not by the author. If you do this, take the power away from the element in the room by pointing straight at its face. Have characters acknowledge how crazy this coincidence is. Have them do as we tend to do in our everyday lives where they try to explain it away and try to justify how it's possible. This will show the reader that you did this on purpose and will leave them wondering why. But make sure to only do this with elephants because if you point out a mouse in the room, then people are gonna be like, oh hey, I didn't realize there was a mouse there until you pointed right at its fuzzy little face and now I can't stop looking at it. Next solution. So this is very universe dependent, but some stories are able to slip luck and coincidences behind a audience accepted broken god machine. And by this I mean things like fate, self-fulfilling prophecies, and the ever dreaded D word, destiny. So these are stories that have internal logic that support things like crazy coincidences and deities pulling strings. You have to be very careful with these because it has to be clear that you're using these threads and strings to thicken and strengthen the plot and not to hold together the rapidly collapsing mess that you created. Next solution, can you foreshadow the hell out of it? If your coincidence is realistic, then foreshadowing can be the glass of water that helps your audience swallow down that pill that you are trying so hard to shove down their throat. Your villain's cybernetic arm malfunctions at the exact second that he's about to squeeze it tight over your protagonist's throat. Now, that's a pretty rare coincidence. But if you foreshadow this by having the arm be visibly damaged at the beginning of the fight and having sparks fly out of it midway through the fight, not only do these little aspects build tension, but the foreshadowing will then help your audience accept that the coincidence is more a coincidence of timing and less a coincidence of just crazy proportion. Think about Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Magic freaking bird shows up with magical tears and it's juggling a hat that has a magic sword in it. And let me see what you have. No! And although some people will claim Deus Ex Machina, most fans will defend this ending. Why? Because it was heavily foreshadowed. Okay, so did that last part not fix or validate your coincidence? Break out your red pen and write a note to yourself reminding you to never edit on paper versions, just edit digitally, why? Don't tell Josh I said that. We offer critiques and he does them. He's really good at finding even the tiniest issues. And every single time he gets a new critique, he prints out all of the pages, writes his notes on the pages, then transfers the pages to Google Docs and then sends them the Google Doc and it hurts my soul to watch. Google Docs, it's a thing, it's amazing. It has everything you need. Here's a video about it. I think it's actually up there, not up there. I'll put it in the description. But anyways, I don't even remember where I was. Coincidences that need to die, yes. First question, are you trying to use coincidences to add twists and turns? For new authors, this can be very tempting. After all, they'll never see it coming. 
But yes, maybe your audience didn't see it coming that the villain would have been defeated because they happened to have a peanut allergy and guess what your protagonist had in their pockets touching their fingers all day. Just kidding, it was an allergy to love because that's a thing. But anyways, maybe they don't see it coming but that doesn't mean they're going to enjoy it. Next question. The least of all accepted forms of coincidences seem to be random sources of aid or solutions, characters having unjustified or previously hidden skills that only seem to emerge right when the main character needs it, and last but not least, characters unrealistically revealing tons of generally very highly secret information right when your protagonist happens to, by complete coincidence, be listening into them. This doesn't apply if your protagonist went looking to try to listen into them in any way. Have you been eavesdropping? I have been dropping no eaves, sir, honest. I was just cutting the grass under the window there. Next question. Is it the climax? If you're trying to use even super tiny minor luck and coincidences anywhere near the climax, you have to tread very carefully. Pretend you're walking on Pringles, not eggshells because no one cares about eggshells. Pringles on the other hand, <laughs> I don't know what I expected. Now I have cat hair and Pringle dust on my shirt. Aren't I classy? So yes, when it comes to your climax, coincidences should only be used to one, make life harder on your protagonist, two, escalate things, and three, get characters in the right place for things to either escalate or get worse for your protagonist. Think of the difference here. Let's pretend that your protagonist is fighting with a villain over a vial containing a zombie virus that targets kittens specifically because why do my examples always end up involving kittens how does this happen don't listen to me no it's a virus that targets people under 5 3 because the villain hates short people you villain there's a tragic backstory that goes with it of course but we're not gonna get into that here because i'm already trying to world build it again okay so they're fighting on the edge of a building and the vial falls and it rolls towards the edge and our protagonist who throughout the length of the story has learned to make sacrifices and be selfless dives straight off the building he grabs the vial as he falls he cradles it to his chest and because of some minor luck, he hits a car, so his bones are badly broken, but he lives. And because he grabbed the vial and cradled it to him, it didn't break. All of the kit, all the short people, right, we made it short people. All of the short people of the world are safe. Now let's rewind. Let's say the vial falls and it rolls and stops one inch away from falling off the ledge. Now that's realistic, but then our character's growth meant nothing. Okay, let's rewind again. Let's say that the vial rolls off the side and this time it's captured in midair by a magical phoenix wearing a hat and juggling a sword. If this was a comedy or parody, hell yes, go for it. Otherwise, this is obviously the wrong solution. I just stepped on the Pringle. <laughs> oh, my feet are now covered in Pringle dust. That is nasty. That's okay, the cats will find it eventually. It'll be a mystical treat for them. Don't tell Josh I said that, that I'm, don't tell him I'm gonna leave the Pringle up in here. So basically the outcome of the climax should be driven by the actions of the character. As the writer, you make the characters, but it should be the characters themselves that are pulling the strings of the story. So as you can tell, there are tons of variables here. And of course, this is completely dependent on your age group and your genre and your story itself, I can't tell you what's right or what's wrong. There are exceptions to every rule and I don't know your story so I don't know what your exceptions might be. I can only tell you what my research told me and that's what this video is. And when in doubt, remember, this is what beta readers and critique partners are for. And Josh, who can tear into your book too if you become a patron like Courtney. I just stepped on the Pringle again. It's in between my toes. It's so nasty. Oh no. Oh no. Thank you so much for watching it. If you found this helpful, make sure to give it a thumbs up and a share. It really helps this channel grow. We really appreciate it. Make sure to subscribe if you aren't already. If you are subscribed, then go ring that bell because you're an overachiever. And thank you so much for watching. As always, I will see you in the next video. Say